Do you like Elvis? What if I told you, you are Elvis. I am Elvis. This ancient Roman coin is Elvis. And you're about to find out why. Rock star, it's now or never. Fact, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. 1 John 4, 8. Elvis Presley was a hunk of hunk of burning love. Burning love. Just a hunk of hunk of burning love. Burning love. Just a hunk of hunk of burning love. Image of God. Just a hunk of hunk of burning love. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Elvis was born poor, but he was blessed with a voice like a chorus of angels, a face that looked like it was carved by Michelangelo, a knack for shaking his hips that would make Cardi B sign up for lessons, and a love of rhinestones that was rivaled only by his love of fried peanut butter and banana sandwiches. So much charisma, such an amazing ability to draw from, or steal from, depending on your perspective, various musical genres. Such an unstoppable fire hose of gold records, he's still the best-selling solo music artist of all time. And yet, at just 42 years old, he died on a toilet. Picture this. The Graceland Mansion. Elvis is sitting on the kingly throne in his bathroom, reading a book titled A Scientific Search for the Face of Jesus. It's about the Shroud of Turin, claimed by some to be the burial cloth of Jesus. Elvis dies while reading about the image of Jesus. What happens then? Allow me to demonstrate. Elvis, who just wants to be your teddy bear, dies, and his fat, bloated body falls forward, but remains folded in the basic seated position. The king of rock and roll was found face down, butt up, on the bathroom floor. He had 14 drugs in his system. Pretty humiliating way to go. A graceless death at a place called Graceland. What happened to Elvis? And I don't mean what happened at the surface level. That part's easy. Famous rock star. Needs some pills to go to sleep. Some more pills for energy to go on stage. He builds up a tolerance, so he needs more and more and more and more. He's the most famous person in the world, so who's going to tell him to stop? Whatever you say, Elvis. Whatever you say, Elvis. Next thing you know, after being prescribed more than 10,000 doses of narcotics, amphetamines, and sedatives just in the first eight months of 1977, his fiance finds his dead body with his big, round, pale butt sticking straight up in the air. And it was a blue Christmas, the Heartbreak Hotel. That's all pretty straightforward, but that's just the surface level. What's really going on here? How can someone so obviously born for greatness be so thoroughly disgraced, demeaned, degraded? And why do we see this happen over and over again? And am I really talking about you and me, even though I'm talking about Elvis? Let's take a look. Several months ago, a movie about Elvis came out with Austin Butler as Elvis and Tom Hanks as Elvis's dirtbag manager, Colonel Tom Parker. There's an interesting scene early in the film. A 19-year-old Elvis is about to go on stage after his first local hit song, and he's terrified. In real life, Elvis never got over his stage fright. Even after years of performing, people would ask him why he was nervous about going on stage. They'd say, how come you never get used to the crowd? And he would reply, it's always a different crowd. So at 19, he was scared to death and nauseous and worried that he was going to forget the words. In the movie, his mom and dad and a few others sing a Christian song with him to calm him down. They sing the 1950s white people version of I'll Fly Away. It's a nice, soft, sweet song. Then we get a flashback to Elvis's childhood. Elvis and some friends look through a hole in the wall at Arthur Crudup, a.k.a. Big Boy Crudup, singing and playing guitar. Elvis hears the music, and he sees how the music affects the ladies. 
But then Elvis and his friends head over to a Christian revival service where they're singing the most epic version of I'll Fly Away in the history of church services. Elvis sneaks into the service to see what's going on. One of his friends tries to pull him back out, but the pastor won't let him. No, he's with the spirit. In that revival tent, young Elvis encounters the spirit of the Almighty, and he starts dancing. He was drawn to the tent by the music, and the music lifts him into the presence of God. And then we get this awesome scene where the film goes back and forth between Elvis shaking as a boy at the revival meeting and Elvis shaking as a 19-year-old as he's getting ready to go on stage at the Louisiana Hayride. The impression you get is that in addition to Elvis's natural talents and abilities, he gets some special spiritual anointing that allows him to move people with his music. But also that in Elvis's mind, the different ways you can move people with music are all jumbled together. So you can sing a song and people start shaking. You can sing a different song and ladies start shaking something else. You can sing a song and get people to praise God. You can also sing a song and get ladies to throw their panties on stage. It's the same ability, but you've got a choice. You can use your gift to get whatever you want. So what do you want? Presence of God? or panties flying at your face. Some of you perverts are thinking, I'd go with the panties, a path that leads to death on a toilet. That's the path Elvis ended up choosing at the Louisiana Hayride. At first, Elvis didn't even understand what these young ladies were screaming about. His bandmates told him it was because of the way he wiggled, and they said he should do it more. And very quickly, Elvis learned that his wiggles amplified the impact of the music. It made the ladies want to rip his clothes off to get a better look at whatever was wiggling. Now, Elvis ended up using his gifts to do all kinds of things. He sang gospel songs. He inspired people. He drew attention to people who were suffering in the ghetto. He helped people. He brought people together. He had endless piles of money thrown at him and had endless piles of panties thrown at him. He did it all. And he did it his way. I did it my way. He kept doing it his way. Until he was found dead on the bathroom floor, literally mooning the world that worshipped him. With a big stamp on his rear end that said, Return to Sender. After years of being simultaneously exalted and degraded, idolized and demonized, after having all the money and fame and women and drugs a rock star could ever dream of, Elvis wanted to see the face of Christ. What happened to that man? The answer lies in this coin. This is a Roman denarius. I bought this from a shop in Jerusalem when my wife and I were in Israel back in 2019. It's a denarius of Tiberius Caesar, the second emperor of the Roman Empire. Tiberius was emperor during the public ministries of John the Baptist and Jesus. The Tiberius denarius is nicknamed the tribute penny because this was the coin that Jesus referred to in a discussion about Jews paying taxes to the Romans in Matthew 22. Let's read the passage. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? This is a brilliant trap. We're calling it a trap. If Jesus says, yes, it's right to pay tribute to the Romans, many Jews would be angry at him for promoting allegiance to their oppressors. But if he says, no, it's wrong to pay tribute to the Romans, the Romans would be angry at him for promoting rebellion against the empire. Either way, Jesus would be in trouble. Like Watch how he answers. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites! 
Why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. So Jesus escapes the trap. But it's easy to miss the point he was making. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. What should you give to Caesar? You should give Caesar that which bears his image, i.e. this coin. Give to God what is God's. What should you give to God? That which bears his image, i.e. you. In other words, You're worried about whether you should give this little piece of silver to Caesar? It's got his image on it. Give it back to him if he wants it. Isn't there something much more valuable that you should be concerned about? Shouldn't you instead be focusing on giving yourself to God? Why are you more worried about the coin than you are about yourself? Get it? Good, because we're not done. You can't see this coin very well from there, so let's get a close-up. Here's a denarius. It bears the image of Tiberius Caesar. In the ancient world, kings would put statues of themselves in various parts of their kingdoms. The image of the king was supposed to be a reminder of the king's authority. Not surprisingly, when governments started issuing coins, they put images of kings and sometimes of queens on the coins. So people carried around reminders of who's in charge in their pockets. Now, without something to compare this coin to, you wouldn't know if it's a really nice coin or a terrible coin. So, here's another Tiberius denarius. This one makes the first one look good by comparison, because apart from a few identifying features, you can barely tell what this coin is. It's almost completely lost its image. Here's a really, really nice Tiberius Denarius. This is graded as choice uncirculated. For whatever reason, it was never passed around. It was never spent. I paid a lot of money for this one just to make this simple point for you. Notice, the choice uncirculated coin is bigger than the other two. Why are they smaller? Well, keep in mind, these are made of silver. So it was very common in the Roman world to practice what's called clipping. You get paid a denarius for your day's work. You take it to buy some groceries for your family. But before you give the coin to the checkout girl, You pull out a small file and file off a little bit of the silver. You put the filings in a bag and then use your denarius to pay for your groceries. If you keep doing this with every denarius you get, you eventually have a bag of silver shavings. And that's worth some money. That's why the circulated coins are smaller than the uncirculated coin. So, what does any of this have to do with Elvis? I'm glad you asked. This denarius is like a young Elvis. It's got the image of the king on it, but it's not perfect. As much as we'd like to think we're perfect when we're young, we definitely don't image God perfectly. We don't know what we're doing. Elvis wasn't perfect even when he was young. He was an imperfect image of God. As life goes on for Elvis, people keep taking little pieces of him like girls ripping off his clothes. Everyone takes a piece of Elvis until by the time he's 42, younger than I am, he's barely recognizable. He still has a great voice, but he's physically and mentally breaking down. So, what's this coin? This coin is like Jesus. Jesus is the perfect image of God. All human beings are created in the image of God, But there are two main components to being the image of God. One, God creates us with certain gifts so that we have the ability to image or reflect God. We have the ability to make the invisible God visible on earth. Two, how we use these gifts is up to us. 
We can use our God-given abilities to image God, or we can use them for other things. We can even use them to degrade ourselves and others. Quite frequently, we don't image God properly. We don't make the invisible God visible on earth. Instead, we use our God-given abilities to try to keep God invisible on earth. When you do that, you're still the image of God, but you're the devil in disguise, too. That's where Christ comes in. Christ, the perfect image of God, the one who truly made God visible on earth, restores our relationship with God. And by looking to Christ and imitating Christ, we grow in our ability to image God. Check out two short passages about this. 2 Corinthians 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God gives us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You'll recall that Elvis died reading a book about the face of Jesus Christ. And Colossians 3, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. We are being renewed in knowledge after the image of our Creator. So, in terms of our three coins, young Elvis is the imperfect image of God. He has amazing talent. He has the ability to image God in all of the relevant ways. But without the knowledge of Christ, without the knowledge of what it means to image God, Elvis doesn't image God very well. The world and its systems degrade the image of God. Everyone takes a piece of Elvis, giving us a damaged, mangled, almost unrecognizable Elvis. In Christ, we see what it means to image God perfectly. What should Elvis have done? He should have used his gifts to be more like Christ. Think about Elvis's fans screaming, trying to grab him, even throwing their panties at him. What were they drawn to? They were drawn to the amazing abilities he was given. Elvis, as the image of God, was supposed to be like a mirror that's at a 45 degree angle so that it reflects upwards. When his fans looked at him and witnessed him using his gifts, he was supposed to remind them of the Almighty. He was supposed to make them look up, as he once looked up, and as he eventually tried to do again. What happens when someone like Elvis, with all his gifts, his looks, his charisma, his golden voice, his sideburns, his blue suede shoes, doesn't point people to the Almighty? He becomes an idol, an object of worship. He takes the gifts that were given to him so that he could point people to God, and he uses them to point people to himself. It didn't matter who was in the room with Elvis. All eyes were on Elvis. But when all eyes are on you, when you're the ultimate idol, the world is going to notice when you die on a toilet. Just so you know, I'm not really making fun of Elvis for the way he died. I might die on a toilet. You might die on a toilet. If old age doesn't get us, some disease or accident or axe murderer will. There are all kinds of ways to die. Some of them are embarrassing. But think about this. Jesus died a humiliating death. 
He was beaten, spit on, paraded through the streets, and nailed to a cross. He was hanging there, naked and bloody, for hours as people mocked and laughed. Sounds much, much worse than dying on a toilet. And yet, we remember those two deaths very differently. Why is the humiliating death of Jesus so incredibly different from the humiliating death of Elvis? Well, when you're imaging God as you should, the world can do its absolute worst, and you'll still be pointing people to God. Crucifixion was designed to be the most horrifying way to execute someone imaginable. Jesus imaged God so perfectly that 2,000 years later, we sing songs about the cross because of the one who was nailed to it. No one will ever sing songs about Elvis's toilet. I said in the beginning that you are Elvis, that I am Elvis. Because his talents and abilities were so visible, so famous, Elvis was just a more conspicuous version of what we all are. We're all created in God's image. We're all given abilities that we're supposed to use to image God. The world and its systems strive to dismantle us piece by piece so that we don't image God as we should. Jesus shows us how to image God to the fullest. Like Elvis, you've got a gift and you've got a choice. When you're using your gift, people might notice but don't use your gift to make yourself an idol. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, what do you have that you didn't receive? Why are you boasting as if you're the source of greatness? So, when you use your gift, and when that attention comes, be ready. Decide in advance how you're going to react. Nice try. It's okay. She's my wife. Ever since the world began, am I right?